All right. Well, I figured out what happened, guys. Uh, my foot happened. So I made the cord to my mic too loose, and without my mic, there is no audio input or output. So I didn't realize exactly how much I'd loosen the cable. That's my bad. But now we're back. So You hear me just fine, right? Yeah, I can hear Sean. Hopefully everybody else can hear Sean. Actually, I can check to see if people can hear Sean. Yeah, people can hear Sean. So, all right, good. Yeah. Where were we? Well, oh, we were just about, about to yeah turn the corner and get to the Japanese. Yeah, who uh, they have the. Uh... <laughs> they got the most carriers. They're... They do. Well, the most least, different types. Yeah, the most they're, types. They're, they're experimenting so much. You it's know? like the Germans have uh, the most kinds of tanks and airplanes. Yeah. So. Yeah, the Japanese never really settle on a standard carrier design the way that the British and Americans essentially do. Isn't that partly uh, just because they lack uh, like a really good steel supply sometimes, so they don't always have the parts they would need to do mass production? I think it's also just, just generally a lot of experimentation with... Um, just generally a lot of experimentation with uh, ship design and not really settling on one. Um I don't think it has to do with steel necessarily, but that that's going to influence the way the Unrayu plays out, though. That's true, but no, they're just they're just they're just trying out a lot of different things and uh, just seeing what works, uh, which is not a terrible thing. It's just that um, uh, they never really seemed well. They do actually find a winning design. They don't really run with it though. But by that time, they really can't. But anyway, that's when you get to the Unrayu. Um, so no, no. So we have the uh, Carrier Hosho. Um, Hosho, yeah, we have the Hosho. Yeah, Hosho. Um, Hosho is a small carrier, only carries about 15 aircraft. Uh, 25 knots, not bad for what it is. Uh, but it, it's it's an experimental ship. It's just so the Japanese can learn the potential of the carrier. The reason it's on this list is that it, when the war started, they did actually put it into frontline service, the Battle of Midway. It served as the carrier supporting... Admiral Yamamoto's main body, which was consists of the battleship Yamato and other warships, and so Hosho is at Midway. Uh, after that, it is retired to the rear, where it will oversee training, and it is one of the only Japanese carriers we're going to talk about that doesn't get sunk. <laughs> kind of a miracle, right? <laughs> so it survives the war. It survives the war, man. It survives the war. Um, so this carrier, if it wasn't for the fact that it was part of the Midway operation, wouldn't even be on here, you know. But it was at Midway, so I got to include it. Um, although I do realize I didn't include the uh, those battle the uh, you know you remember you know about the Japanese carrier battleships. You know about these? No. Yeah, after Midway and at desperation, they took two of their older battleships, the Eyes and Hagoi, and converted them into battleship carrier hybrids, but never really operated them that way. These things were a total failure. Absolutely ridiculous. Oh, were those the ones where they would have, like, four planes on them, but also still have all their guns? No, they had some of their guns, and I believe they could carry, like, maybe 20 aircraft, but they couldn't retrieve aircraft. So whatever they launched would have to land somewhere else. What? Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> that is fucking uh, stupid. Yeah, that, I mean, that was just... Des that, that's, one of the, that's one of the most daft things you'll ever see in World War II. It's a desperation thing, though, you know? Um, so anyway, um, yeah, Hosho, I mean, maybe Hosho does exactly what it needs to do. It's not like a great design, though, but that's not what it's there for. Uh, I'd give it a... Hmm. I guess it's like, I guess it's kind of like Hermes in that sense, where you could say like it's a C. You know, it's doing its mission. Maybe not like I mean, maybe it could it could have possibly been a better carrier design, but after all, this is like one of the very first ones. Yeah, I mean, this thing's you know? this thing was sort of rushed to completion, and it it entered service in 1922. Yeah. So it was it was the most ancient of all the aircraft carriers in the entire world. Yeah. And so now survived the war. But then we get into the Japanese start going for the big stuff almost right away. You have Akagi. The Akagi. Yeah. Um, so Akagi, 
the way the uh, the Kagi could also hold um, a large number of aircraft. Now, a lot of people will misread the Japanese with that. They'll say, like, oh, look, a Kagi, it says it's going to hold, like, 90 airplanes. It's like, well, some of those are storage, you know, um, like, a, like reserve aircraft. Typically, a Kagi was rocking about 60 to 70 airplanes, roughly, that were actually going to be active. The rest are in storage. Um, a Kagi is a conversion of the battle cruiser, so it's fast, large. Um... The Akagi conforms to Japanese thinking, which is that you have an enclosed hangar, and but no armored flight deck at all. Okay, even though um, so, even though Akagi has, is a little bit better protected than some of the other Japanese carriers comparatively, uh, but that doesn't say much. Um, it's a good warship overall. Originally designed with three separate flight decks, that didn't really work out too much, so eventually it was modernized to have the single flight deck. Because it was the first major carrier commissioned and could hold as much aircraft as it did and was fast, it was the flagship of the uh, Kiru Butai, the uh, Japanese carrier force, all the way until Midway. Uh, Akagi's pilots during the war are the best of the best. I think I read somewhere that like one third of all of the uh, hits made on warships, or maybe maybe even more than that, at Pearl Harbor were done by Akagi. Like Akagi, Akagi's uh, pilots uh, really carried the uh, burden at uh, Pearl Harbor in that regard. Uh, but that said, the Akagi has the problems that Japanese carriers have. You know, you're storing oil in extra spaces. You're, you're turning the ship into a gas can. It has bad damage control. The enclosed hangar means that whatever fires break out will just fester inside there. And of course, there's no armor, so you are going, if you do take hits, it's going to be serious. You know? In addition to that, Akagi does not hold as many aircraft as, you know, American carriers. It's, it's, in, it's aircraft, the amount of aircraft that's actually going to wield in a battle is comparable to Ranger, which is not uh, the best thing you can be. Um, so, Akagi, uh, the, the reason it did as well as it did early in the war has to do with the quality of its pilots. And at that point, it's not even like the best carrier around, you know. Oh, another problem with the Japanese, too, you'll notice their islands are small on right. their carriers, typically. And that was bad because the American islands tend to be big. You know, going with the Lexington had a large island. Uh, and, of course, the experience of not having an island on the um, Ranger uh, showed how much you need one. The Japanese islands are small, and that actually does hamper a lot of their staff work, or at least makes it very cramped. So the Americans had the better idea there with the larger islands, like you see on Enterprise and, of course, Yorktown. I mean, we see on, like, Yorktown, of course, as you later see on Essex. Um, so... Yeah. Wait, did we disconnect again? No, we're fine. We're, we're didn't? good. Okay, we're fine? Good, good, yeah. good. Okay, I'm just checking. Um, yeah, we're good. Okay, there we are. I'm sorry, I looked over and I didn't see... Is the stream going? Like, Yeah, it's going. Stuff, or is... It's not uh, slow or anything. Okay, because... All right, I got you. Let me, um, let me do something here real quick. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right, got it. Sorry, everybody. The stream uh, on my end didn't um, didn't show up, I guess, or something. Or wait, what's up? Oh, damn. Let me see something real quick. All right, how many do we have watching right now? Um, we have 33. 33? Is the chat disabled? Because I don't see the no, chat. No, the chat is still going. It's The people who are in it are still doing their thing. Must be an issue in my end. Okay, I'm gonna reload real quick here. But anyway, what was I saying? Yeah, the the Akagi is is good when it's made. It has major problems though, and in many ways it's already outclassed by the time the war starts. The success it has is because of its air crews. Uh, so, so in my opinion, I would give Akagi uh, a C. What do you think of that? That seems fair. I guess it, I mean, if you're talking about its actual design versus performance, it sounds like it massively overperformed, and a lot of it had to do with the air arm more so than the ship. 
Yeah, the, the ship's got a lot of design problems. It should also be noted that it was sunk by one bomb. And there was also a near miss that caused significant damage. But essentially, it sunk by a bomb. Was this That's the pretty... ship that Dick Best took out, or which one was that? Yeah, this is the one Dick Best takes out. And to be fair, where he landed his bomb was exactly the spot you didn't want it land. You didn't want to land it if you're Japanese. You know, you did not want to hit there. Hey, Dick was he the best, the so... Well, of his name is Dick Best, you know? Yeah, he hit it right on the money. Hit the G-spot yeah. of the carrier. <laughs> the next one is the uh, Kaga. The Kaga only happens because the other the other battle cruiser was damaged during the Great uh, Earthquake. So instead, they have to convert a battleship into a carrier. Uh, Kaga has uh, Kaga in that re in that regard does have uh, some problems. Uh, it is slower, only 28 knots. It does carry a decent aircraft complement. That's for that's that that must be said. But um, only a little bit more than a Kagi, though. Only a little bit more. One thing I found interesting about it was I'd read somewhere that the crew of the Kaga really liked serving on the ship, and because it was because of its size, it was actually one of the more comfortable ships to serve on. All right. At any rate. Kaga's problem is it has even more armor issues than Akagi has. It's slower. It does carry about the same amount of aircraft. Um, the Japanese are having it used as a frontline carrier because, I mean, because it can carry a lot of airplanes, but it does kind of slow the fleet down just a bit, you know? Uh, so Kaga's decent, and Kaga's definitely going to be, like, the best battleship conversion into a carrier because, you know... Neither Eagle and especially Burn, none of those are anything to be too proud of, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, Kaga, I mean, Kaga gets lit up like a Christmas tree at Midway. I mean, the ship practically burns almost down to the uh, waterline. Uh, I think Kaga's like a D. So the two, the two major Midway ships were both in the late 20s, uh, Kagi 1927, Kaga 1929. So I guess they were yeah. somewhat dated designs by then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was Kaga at Pearl Harbor? Uh, yes. Yes, Kaga was most certainly at Pearl Harbor. Um, now, the Japanese then decide that they are going to do a light carrier, Ryujo. Uh, I'd pull up a picture of Ryujo if you can because people need to see how weird this one is and actually it is the image that we have for the aircraft carrier development video that we did last week oh right uh, Ryujo, yeah, Ryujo's bridge is below the carrier deck very unusual right <laughs> right I mean kind of cool kind of cool but unusual <laughs> yeah no, this is an ugly ship yeah. Um, this one has to do with the London Naval Treaty. Um, so, so Ryujo is is, has to be built within a certain tonnage limitation. Uh, the ship will only make about 29 knots. It tend to be top heavy and not very stable, so it didn't have the best sea keeping, especially when it was first built. Um, yeah. Uh, Decent air wing for the time, but yeah, that got its air wing was got smaller and smaller as the uh, as the years went on. Simply because you know the the Japanese just uh, they have they're using like they have more and more uh, they, the aircraft's getting bigger, you know. Uh, yeah, Ryujo is not a great ship, really. <laughs> it's it's. I mean, it is it, for its time. It's it's a decent enough light carrier, but it's definitely outclassed by something like you know the Courageous, for instance. You know, um, and uh, it did it did pretty well during World War II, supporting a variety, variety of amphibious operations. But the first major carrier battle, it's in, it gets sunk. Um, there's some debate on if the Japanese reason is a decoy or not. I don't think so. I think what they were doing in Eastern Solomon's was Ryujo was supposed to take out Henderson Field. And then it was kind of turned into a decoy, you know. Um, so yeah, Ryujo is just not a great ship, really, though. 
uh, especially with those, I think would really make Simi have to go with it's an E. Is that okay? While it was very useful for the Japanese and they used it well, kind of like Ranger, it's just not a great design overall. Yeah, I mean, to and me, it looks like a river that, barge. Yeah, it's also telling kind of the Japanese really didn't go in this direction with their other uh, light carriers. I guess they put that out to sea, played with it a while, and said, oh man, this sucks. Yeah, they're like, yeah, not, not the best idea, guys, you know. I guess we'll keep uh, it, but... I mean, yeah, we're going to keep it. We're going to use it, right? <laughs> really <laughs> wish we'd built it a little differently. Mm -hmm. Another thing to keep in mind, too, I forgot to mention, Akagi had its island on the left side of the ship. Um, you know, like, you know, in other words, like, it's, it didn't have the island where it well, is on almost every other aircraft carrier ever made, right? Right. You know? That's just unusual. That, that's, that, that tells you about the Japanese and their whole thing about experimenting, you know? So, then you get into the um, two of the most interesting ones, the Soryu and the Hiryu, which are sometimes considered to be of the same class, and they are very similar, but, you know, Hiryu was heavier, maybe slightly better armor, uh, not by much, but, like, a little bit better armored, and um, also had its island on the... Uh, um, on the opposite side as well. Um, these two are really interesting. Uh, they are fast. Soryu is like 34 knots, right? Uh, same thing with Hiryu. They carry about a, only a little fewer aircraft than the Akagi, all right? It, so you get these two ships super fast that carry a decent complement of aircraft. But they have, like, no armor at all, especially Soryu. Um, this old the thing they were talking about, that, like, like about the Battle Midway, there was a her, her discussion where they were, they were talking about, okay, about, you know, like, if there were more Japanese carriers there, how would they have done? What if the Americans had more carriers or fewer carriers? But the guy said, but no matter what happens, the Soryu is probably sinking. <laughs> You know, um, so anyway, uh, Soryu is, I mean, the Japanese ones can be hard to rate, but Soryu is particularly difficult just because, on the one hand, decent complement of aircraft and fast, uh, but man, is it vulnerable, you know? Uh, so it's a tough one. I'd give the Soryu, um, a D. But I would give the Hiryu a C, because it's again slightly, uh, just slightly better, uh, better design overall, and still pretty vulnerable, but not like Soryu. Well, I say not like Soryu. I mean they're pretty close, but still, uh, no matter what happened during World War II, Soryu is never going to make it to the end. <laughs> just a little too, um, little too glass jawed. But I think what's kind of cool about Soryu and Hiryu is that they're uh, they're almost like the ultimate version of like a Wasp or a Ranger in that regard because they are once they they have great sea keeping they're very they're fast they're very maneuverable so they have a lot of advantages they just they're extremely vulnerable that's their issue you know um, I'm still impressed the Japanese were able to make a carrier of that tonnage that could have that many aircraft and go that fast it's kind of cool right so that's why I'll give Hiryu a C. So I guess it's sort of like the Jap ultimate version of the Japanese philosophy of pure offense with carrier tactics. Yeah, yeah, and, and interestingly enough, the guy who was in command of both of them, you know, from you know uh, at Pearl Harbor and Midway, was Yamaguchi, who was considered the most aggressive of the Japanese carrier commanders at that time. I guess he had the uh, right that, ships that was, for the job. Yeah, yes. It, the other thing to think thing about him too was. Um, he was Yamamoto's favorite. He was Yamamoto wanted him to be commander of Kido Butai. Nagumo gets the command, even though he doesn't actually believe in carriers, but he gets it to sate the surface fleet faction and to make Nagano, who's the actual head of the Japanese Navy, happy. You know, and Nagumo, to his credit, uh, Nagumo, to his credit, uh, relied a lot on this. Well, Japanese admirals in general relied a lot on their staff, but he in particular relied on a lot of talented aviation officers like Genda to. Uh, uh, to oversee things. And Nagumo himself was pretty popular with his men, so 
I, Nagumo definitely wasn't like a great commander, but I think he got a little. Uh, I think he got a little too much hate in the years after the war. You know, all things considered. Uh, but probably Japan's best carrier commander would have been Ozawa, who of course was the uh, the leader at. Um, sorry, missing. Yeah, we have Ozawa, who was the uh, commander at um, Philippine Sea and Leyte Gulf. You know. Anyway, so. What's our next guy? Oh, next guy is probably my personal favorite, the Shikaku. Oh, from 1941. Um, yeah, there's an entire debate that this is the... Um, these carriers were new. Uh, they've only been in service a few months before they go into Pearl Harbor. That means that they had the least experienced air crews, which means they're still excellent, right? But they, their air crews were t at Pearl Harbor were... Uh, were um, given the mission of destroying um, uh, the airfield. These carriers are, they're fast, 34 knots, large, East Norway anti-aircraft guns, uh, you know, for, for a Japanese carrier, that is. But the good thing about them is they're relatively sturdy, and they didn't have armored flight decks, but they actually had more armor than most other Japanese carriers at this time. And Shikaku is going to be damaged numerous times. Coral Sea takes some, uh, takes some uh, minor damage, at Eastern Solomons, damaged again at Santa Cruz, and survives. In the end, it's only sunk by a submarine. Um, you ever read about the sinking of the Shikaku? No. Uh, absolute hell on the seas. Um, the submarine Cavallo, which actually you can visit in Galveston, Texas, put a few torpedoes into her. Uh, fires rage out of control. The crew got on the deck to salute as the flag was lowered. And then the ship suddenly started sinking, like it went, like one of the elevators filled with water. So the ship very, when it takes its final plunge, it happens very quickly. And the way it sinks, it's almost kind of like the Titanic where the stern is going up in the air. And that meant that the crew were tumbling down the flight deck into the ocean. The worst, though, was that hangar number three, I want to say, was where a raging fire was. And men literally tumbled right into the fiery pit as the ship sank it exploded underwater uh, so pretty horrific huh yeah it's pretty fucked up it's pretty fucked up man Shikaku though was considered unlucky it got hit so many times you know um, but yeah these carriers carried a decent amount of aircraft that's probably the one thing why I'm not going to go with S tier on them is they only carried about 70 planes that could be active not bad it's just that their American opponents kind of outclass them in that regard Ah. But the ship was also sturdier than the Yorktowns, so you can make a case these were superior to the Yorktowns. I don't know. I think you can go either way on that. They're they're just about equal to begin with. There's like if the Shikaku is superior to the Yorktown, it's not by too too much. So it's kind of a one so, A no, one B situation. Yeah, yeah. Zuikaku, which was actually called Lucky Crane, uh, that one only got damaged at Philippine Sea, minor damage. And then was sunk at Leyte Gulf with a great photo. You've seen the photo of the uh, Shikaku sinking, right? Probably. Yeah, we put it. I think we put it up on here before. You can see the uh, the guys on the deck saluting as the flags lowered, and you can you see the carrier listing. It's a great photograph. Oh, I the one where it's on its side, basically. Yeah, where it's practically on its side, and they're all saluting. And then the next photo, the last photo, is in the yell bonsai. Ah. Oh. But yeah, I mean. <laughs> The thing about the Shikaku is that these are great carriers. The Japanese really don't go down this road, and that's because they really can't afford to build anything this good again. <laughs> so basically all these designs that come after are just pale imitations now that Japan is in the war and has limited resources. Exactly. And this is where, I mean, you know, this is where you're going to get some really bad classes coming up, you know. But no, can't say enough with the Shikaku's uh, superb ships. You know, um, I think if they had a slightly bigger air wing, it'd definitely be S tier. So, how does it compare with another ship that came out in 1941, the Shoho? Yeah, the Shohos originally were uh, submarine tenders. Um, they can go about 28 knots. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly how many aircraft they carry. I want to say it was maybe like 20 or 30 or something. Let me see. Uh, that's for you, Joe. 
Yeah, Shoho or, well, or Zuiho class, I guess we knew more uh, technical about it. They, they know they did carry a decent air wing, and Shoho had a very short career. <laughs> it was only commissioned for like a few months and was sunk at Coral Sea. That's with the famous line, scratch one flat top. Um, Zuiho uh, continued to serve at, um, was that like Midway, Eastern Solomons? So Zuiho, because it was, uh, because of its speed and because of the rest of it, the Zuiho would serve with the Shikaku and the Zuikaku in 1942. Typically, Zuiho was being used only for making sure there was a decent combat air patrol, while Shikaku and Zuikaku would concentrate on airstrikes. Very good system, I must say. Um, this class, though, had the, uh, the problem any one of these Japanese carrier classes have. It has almost no armor, right? And keep in mind that, too. Remember, Shikaku class is pretty sturdy. It has a decent uh, torpedo defense system, for instance. Shoho, these things, I mean, um, you know, Zuiho, it just, it just really doesn't, you know? And that's a, uh, that's a significant problem. So, yeah, Shoho was lit up like a Christmas tree. Zuiho was also a little Christmas tree. I think it. I think it took like ten or eleven bomb hits. I want to say. Let me look that up real quick. It was insane. All right. Pulling this one up on the uh, Japanese Navy thing here. Yeah, battle off Cape Pagano. Yeah, this thing got battered to pieces. There were seven near misses as well from bombs. That's just insane. Uh, that said, these are better than Ryujo for sure. Now, they don't have an island, unfortunately, but uh, they're about as fast as Ryujo. They carry about the same amount of aircraft, but they're more stable at sea. And I think they overall prove to be much more useful, even if they're not, like, great ships. So the Shoho class... Hmm. I'd give it a D. So what what's the Japanese carrier type where when they would see planes coming or torpedo bombers, rather than uh, if they couldn't shoot them down, they would actually try to dodge incoming bombs and torpedoes? Yeah. Is this the Shoho class or is that all these things? I mean, that's, that's generally how they do it, especially in 1942. And Japanese helmsmen are good. They're really good at dodging bombs and torpedoes. Actually pretty good, but... It's an inferior method compared to anti-aircraft guns, you know. Uh, that's actually nothing that contributes in midways. The Japanese escorts keep their distance, so they can't add their anti-aircraft gun fire to even help the carriers out in the first place. Um, but anyway, then you get to one of uh, one of the most bizarre ones for the Japanese, the uh, Hiyo class, which includes Hiyo and Junyo. I've heard of the Junyo. What'd you say? Yeah, I've heard of the Junyo. I know it took part in a lot of important battles. Uh, Junyo did eventually. Not at first, though. Junyo's first uh, operations were the Aleutian Islands. But anyway, so... Uh, these originally were luxury ocean liners. The Japanese plan... The Japanese had this thing, though, where if they were going to get into a war, there were certain ships that they could acquire and then rapidly convert into an aircraft carrier. That's what the plan was with this one. So the Japanese, as they're approaching uh, war, you have things like Shoho and Zuiho being uh, converted, and of course Junyo and Hiyo. Junyo and Hiyo are weird. They have actually a fairly large island, especially for the Japanese. Oh, by the way, we didn't even talk about funnels. Japanese were really weird about this. Some of their exhaust funnels were at the, um, were at the hangar level. Which could, of course, mean that a lot of the smoke is blowing into the hangar sometimes or on the deck. Um, in the case of this one, the funnel is on top of the island, but it's slanted, going outward. Oh, so just, yeah. It's a, uh, there's it's another weird-looking funnel. There's another picture I saw of this. Maybe it was actually a drawing where they had the smoke coming out really hard. And even though it's clearly just regular exhaust, it looks like the carrier is on fire. Yeah. Now... The problem with this class is their speed. They're only going about 24, 25 knots, you know. They do carry a decent amount of aircraft at about 50. So surprisingly large air wing, but you also have a carrier that's kind of slow. It's one of its biggest problems was just its electrical system was made for a luxury liner, 
which means it's not the best uh, electrical system for an aircraft carrier. So it had a lot of technical problems. Um, eventually, though, Junyo and Hiyo would be put into frontline service. In fact, Junyo took place in the Battle of Santa Cruz Islands, and it was their aircraft that made the uh, that made the uh, hits on Hornet that ultimately doomed the ship. You know. Um, so anyway, these carriers are interesting and they're odd. And they did have a decent complement of aircraft, but they're not particularly fast. They have electrical problems. Um, they're just not great warships. I guess I'll give them a D just because they do have a large air wing. So credit to them on that one. Yeah, it's pretty good considering that, uh, I mean, this is kind of a bullshit concept, taking an ocean liner <laughs> and throwing a flight deck on it and putting a big funnel that spews smoke off the side. I mean, it, it no, looks no, like, no, 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 this no, looks the, like a no, Frankenstein's is, monster. No, the funnel, no, the funnel is not on the hangar side. The, the funnel is on the island, like it should be. The Akagi was the one where the smoke would be coming on the flight deck because it's the, because the funnel, the funnel oh. is actually pointed down towards the ocean. Oh, it's okay. Goofy. Yeah, that's yeah, the one no. I must be thinking of, but I saw that picture and I thought, god damn. But you got a point there about you know um, about the uh, about it being like a Frankenstein's monster, you know. Yeah, it seems like it's a bad idea that worked better than it should have. Yeah. Bad idea, but decent execution. Um. So that leads us to the Ry Ryuho. Yeah, Ryuho. Oh God, this one just sucks, man. <laughs> <laughs> This is bad. Uh, Ryuho is one of these, like, um, one of the um, originally a, uh, sorry, originally a uh, submarine tender. You know, the Zuiho and Shoho have the advantage of at least having, like, not a great speed, but not too bad, right? Ryuho only goes about 26 knots, okay? It's not a great conversion. <sighs> You know, it, it, it carries about 30 aircraft, which is not bad, but, you know, I, I think for an aircraft carrier, especially in the Japanese, if you're below 28 knots, you're a liability. You know, 28, I mean, only because you're only going to do that one because, you know, Kaga has a large flight wing, so. Uh, but, yeah, just, um, yeah, this one's just bad, man. <laughs> Yeah, um, it looks kind of shoddy. It's another one of those where it looks like a wave could just knock it right on its side. Yeah, it, it, it's... It only really... I mean, it saw action in the Philippine Sea. Uh, I want to say that the Philippine Sea was considered to have the worst uh, air crew. Like, the worst pilots. <laughs> which is saying something. So yeah, Ryuho, not very good, man. I, it's it, this, is, this, to me, is about as F-tier as it gets. Man, I think Burn is better. For instance, at least Burn carries a few more planes. <laughs> yeah. And also, Burn. I mean, Burn has the excuse of like, hey, you know, we're still trying to figure out this carrier thing. You know. Yeah, Burn is also 15 years older. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so yeah. Let me see. I want to let me look something up with Ryuhu real quick. I want to see if there's uh, something else about it. Um. It, well, that's what I wanted to check. I was curious if it was converted after Midway, or was it one of the Pearl, what I call like the, the uh, those conversions they're doing, they start before Pearl Harbor, right around the time of Pearl Harbor. And uh, yeah, no, it was, it, they started conversion December 1941. It only took about a year to convert, though. So credit to the Japanese on that one. This whole conversion thing they had planned out, sure, some of these ships were shoddy, but they did get them out fast. <laughs> Well, I mean, you'd hope so. If you're going to produce something that's not that good, at least do it quickly. Mm. And I guess, uh, so we talked about earlier the best air cruiser on Akagi. So is that probably the worst part of the loss for the Japanese was losing those elite squadrons? Yeah, even though Japanese uh, uh, pilot losses at Midway were not that bad, considering. Uh Eastern Salmons and Santa Cruz Island really are like a stake in the heart for them. Because by that time, American anti aircraft gun, they have more of them and they have better doctrine too. You know? Um, so, anyway, who is up next? We have the Chitosi here. Oh, Chitosi. 
Yeah, Chit okay, Chitosi is one of your post midway conversions. So Chitosi originally was a seaplane carrier, pretty cool looking seaplane carrier too. The decision was eventually made to convert both Chitose and its sister ship Chayota. Um, these are kind of comparable. These are essentially like Zuihos. They're about the same speed, uh, lack of armor, of course, around the same number of aircraft. So they're very, very similar. And in that regard, I would say it's going to have the same rating. You know, so it's another D. Uh, both of these were sunk at. Um, both of these were sunk at Midway. I'm sorry, not at Midway, but Leyte Gulf. So basically, by the time these things, these sort of makeshift carriers, got into service, even if they had been much better, they were still probably going down, just because of how much the war had shifted. And keep point keep in mind, these are all inferior to the Independence class carriers, which have more anti-aircraft guns, better anti-aircraft guns, and they're faster. You know, so you know they're pretty weak compared to um, to what they're even competing against. You know, uh, so once again you're now, so once again you're seeing the decline of the uh, of the uh, Japanese carrier force as the war goes on. I guess it's also worth noting that by 1944, I mean Japanese planes by this point were woefully inferior to what the Americans were putting out. Uh, I don't know, not necessarily. Um, I mean, they had a few designs the, uh, that were out that were comparable, but they couldn't produce them in bulk. The Zero was basically outdated by this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the, uh, the, um, the, the, okay, the successor to their dive bombers, which was the, uh, we called it the, um, we called it the Judy, as the D4Y, that one had problems, so that was very fast. But the torpedo bomber they had, very good at, at Philippine Sea. The problem is, you know, you're just not very. Um, uh, the problem you're the problem you run into is air crew quality, really. And we also have really good anti-aircraft guns, Hellcats, and Corsairs around. Yeah, exactly. So without the uh, without a way to offset that, even the elite dive bombers are not gonna, or torpedo planes or whatever they were, and it's not going to be enough. They're just going to do well on their way to death. Yeah. And now you have what some people consider uh, the one that really died before its time, the Tahoe. The Tahoe yeah. Now, this is the one I, I read a tiny bit about, and uh, fuck, man. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's painful, the way this one died. Yeah. It, it, just, about, just about as bad, if not worse, than Shikaku. Although... Unrayu and Shinano also have some really horrible deaths as well. Well, for me, this one has to be the, the take the cake just because uh, they dodge most of the hits coming at them and a pilot actually sacrifices his life and his aircraft to stop a torpedo. Yeah. And then they take one hit, and then hours later, after that heroic and noble sacrifice, the ship blows, and they lose almost, what, 80% of the crew, 90%? So, I mean, Something like that. Yeah, you have this great sacrifice. You have a helmsman who did his job and dodged all the torpedoes. And just one hit that got through out of all the shots at it takes it out and kills almost all hands. Fuck. And that's, beca that's because they, they, were venting, they were venting the carrier. And in venting it, they were... They were, they were, uh, they were, they were venting the fumes throughout the carrier... Which meant it was only a matter of time before the thing just blows up. You know, uh, improper training of the crew. Uh, once again, bad Japanese damage control here. Uh, yeah. So, and the thing too is that I mean, this is a pretty well designed ship. I mean, the Japanese are doing the armored flight deck things. They decide to copy the British on this one. Only they have a very large air wing for that for armored flight deck. I want to say about sixty aircraft. So you have a decent size air wing. Um, you know, it's well built. It's just that, you know, the crew is going to matter as much as the design, right? You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the crew dooms this one. It's a well designed ship. <laughs> you know, we only have like two or three photos of this thing as well. Well, yeah, it didn't last long. There wasn't enough time. I mean, they put it out to sea, broke the champagne bottle on it, and then it blew up. Yeah. <laughs> 
Also, could go, could go 31 knots. Oh, that's right. We have... It looks like we only have two photos of this ship, ever. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> oh, God, I love what it says on here thing. It says, like, um, uh, this link on the um, combinedfleet.com says, see all two photos of Tahoe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's just sad, man. That's just depressing. <laughs> it is, but it's also not at all surprising, though. And I guess the Japanese no. weren't really looking to make sure that they commemorated it properly. Like, okay, let's look at this son of a bitch out there. We're about to fight an all for no all or nothing sea battle. So, yeah, I'll give it. I mean, I mean, I'm, we're just basing it on its design, really. Uh, I'll give it a tier. This is the only carrier after the Shikaku that's worth a damn. Oh, you, you know. Okay, so you think you think the explosion was mostly incompetence and bad damage control, but the design was. Uh, pretty good oh maybe b then because there is a, there is some statements that some of the design also led to the ship sinking and i guess it really isn't as good as say um illustrious or whatnot but anyway I, it, it's it's a good design it's a b i'll go the b it's a good design um it just it's just so i it just it, it's just so unlucky you know yeah Oh man, uh, and now we have the Unrio, which uh, the first image that popped up and the most prominent one was of it, it's on on its side, so I'm hoping there's a good story here. Yeah, the, um, okay, so the Unryu is essentially just like an improved, or well, the Unryu, I on Ryu, but whatever, it's essentially just an improved Kiryu class, which is the wrong direction, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I don't think the here you proved to be all that uh, durable. No. So the idea with this one is um, it's going to carry about as much as, as much of the here use, roughly the same amount of aircraft, maybe just a little bit more. Um, uh, it is. It is. It is to its credit. It is a fast ship. Like I said, decent air wing. Uh, once again, we have almost a complete lack of any kind of armor. Uh, but fast and maneuverable, at least, right? Um, the Unrayu... So he gets the uh, Unrayu Amaji Katsuragi. Katsuragi was scrapped. Uh, Amaji was sunk in the uh, July 1945 air raids. And then Unrayu was sunk, I believe, on its maiden voyage. <laughs> By Redfish. <laughs> um, one thing about the class that has to be known is that at this point the Japanese really don't think that they are going to be able to. Uh, they, they're having industrial problems. I had read that a lot of metal had to be contributed by just civilians just to get the Unryu finished. So a lot of this also to do with the uh, with those pressures as well. Um, probably, yeah, economic pressures. Anyway, so. The Unryus do not take part in any of the uh, carrier battles. And Unryu itself... Oh, by the way, there's only one photo of Unryu. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah, no. Now, wait, you said you have a picture of it on its side. I don't see it. It's a drawing. Uh... It's a drawing, okay. Well, we have only two photos of Unryu. We have one, we have, oh, I'm sorry, we only have one where it's underway. And we have one where it's sinking. That's all we have. Well, I mean, that's the whole story of its life, you know? That's, <laughs> that's what else do you need? <laughs> I do feel really bad for this one. So what happens is, after, after Leyte Gulf, the last operations of the Japanese Navy are them ferrying aircraft and kamikaze-type weapons to other locations. In the case of Unryu, it is being sent to um, Philippines, uh, Philippines, and it's supposed to be bringing in a shipment of... Let me see, it's got... Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. On its flight deck, it had army equipment, like barges, trucks, even cannons, and it had these Okaku flying bombs, all right? So, essentially, when this thing got torpedoed, it was filled with kamikaze weapons. That's why it sinks the way it does. <laughs> um, 
yeah, horrendous loss of life. No one to this day is sure how many people died aboard because we don't actually have a complete manifest of how many army personnel were on board. Okay? Mm. Uh, let me see. Yeah, something like... Um, yeah, the um, captain died aboard as well. Uh, only 146 people were saved from the ship. And it lost anywhere from 1,100 to maybe in excess of 1,500 people. Values, I think, are just... I mean, I get why the Japanese are doing what they're doing. They're, they're in a really bad situation as far as this goes, right? But it's just a bad ship design. Well, not bad, bad. It's just it's the wrong direction, you know? Um, so for me, this class, I mean, sure, it's like a better hear you, but that's not what you need if you can get away with it. And uh, I'd give it an E. Okay. And our last ship of the evening is the Shinano from 1944. Yeah, this one's ridiculous. Because originally it's supposed to be the Yamato. So this thing's like 71,000 tons. I mean, that's like the damn Titanic, okay? All right? So... What's interesting is that it would have also had a massive crew of over 2,000. Despite its large size, it didn't wasn't supposed to carry a lot of aircraft. Only about 40 or 50, 40 to a 60, roughly. Uh, only makes 28 knots. Its actual point is to be a aircraft replenishment and repair facility, repair carrier. Uh, but by this anyway, time, the Japanese barely have any carriers. I mean, what what do they need this for? I mean, it would make sense uh, if you had a bunch of carriers, but at this point, the <laughs> fleet is depleted. I mean, was this commissioned right. early in the war or something? No, no. Remember, this is supposed to be the sister ship Fumato, right? Oh. Yeah. So, it's being laid down as a battleship. Um, and what happened is, is that after Pearl Harbor, they suspended construction of the ship, and then it was decided to convert her into a carrier, I believe, after Midway. Yes, it's after Midway. So this is one of these emergency Midway ships. Alright? Oh, by the way, how many photos are there of Shinano? Do you know? Uh, when it was launched and when it sank? I don't know. Unfortunately, we only have one. Oh. Just one. We don't, have this, we don't even have a sinking photo, unfortunately. And I'm talking about, when I say finish, when we got some photos of it under construction, I just mean like we only have one photo of it underway. You know. Anyway, the crew is not properly trained, um, and what happens is is that um, they doesn't have the, not all the watertight doors are secured, so this ship will also sink with a horrendous loss of life. Um, I mean, you know, really looking at this thing, I mean, on the one hand, okay, sure, it doesn't really carry like an amazing amount of aircraft. Um, it's kind of slow for a carrier at that point. Although, funny enough, it being of a battleship design, it should have done better taking a torpedo hit. But once again, poor crew training plays a big part in this loss of this one. Uh, one thing Shinano did have, though, was a lot of anti-aircraft guns. Uh, that was one thing it was not skimping on, so it might have been tougher than the average one. But, you know, at the, I mean, tougher than the average one as far as that goes. But yeah, in the end, I mean, this is another bad carrier design done by a desperate navy that's losing a war it's probably never going to win to begin with um so I guess I go with an E on this one too alright well it seems like there might have been I mean when people figured out how to build a carrier right they could build a masterpiece but there were a whole lot of ways to do it wrong <laughs> yeah man. it's experimental you know um, so yeah, I mean it's a new type of ship, and you're absolutely right. Because I think if you're if you're doing like a battleship tier list for World War II, there aren't like a ton of like poorly designed battleships, you know. Like I mean, right. each one of them will have some of their strengths and weaknesses. Unless you're like the Iowa class, there are no, really really aren't too many weaknesses there. But if we're doing a battleship tier ranking, then it'd just be a bunch of like S's, A's, B's, and C's. I mean. Maybe some of the old older battleships would be ranked lower, but even then, like those old battleships, wherever their flaws, they still had some pretty powerful guns on them. 
you know? So that's why I, I would never really want to do a battleship tier ranking because with things like aircraft carriers, and I'd also say cruisers and destroyers, there's a lot more variation in quality from ship to ship at this time. Uh, but not so much with battleships. Yeah, I guess, you know. to be fair, we'd pretty much figured out the battleship by this point. Yeah, like if you're doing World War One, you actually would have a number. Like a lot of those uh, British battle cruisers that, you know, blew up at Jutland. Um, I mean, there's a lot of debate on those because the point of the battle cruisers wasn't to go, like, fighting at Jutland. It was to hunt down the enemy's cruisers. And in that regard, they were very successful at the Falkland Islands. That was what they were designed for. But you can make a case that uh, for a variety of battleships in World War One that are poorly designed, like uh, some of the French designs are very bad, for instance. But, you know, and by the time you get to World War II, not so much. Now, you do have a few cases. So, for instance, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Italians took some of their old battleships and converted them, like uh, the uh, you know, Caesar and whatnot, and those weren't very good. But I know why the Italians did it. If they wanted to, they, they, it's, it's a cheap alternative for them to simply take an old battleship and just make it faster, right? It's not a great idea, but I get why you're doing it. You have, Italy, is, Italy, like Japan, has a lot of industrial constraints compared to the other countries in particular. You know, but yeah, you just don't really have a ton of battleships in World War II. You're like, well, that's terrible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then meanwhile, you have like, you know, like on Ryu, which being fair to it, isn't Ryu like a bad ship? No, if, and if, actually if on Ryu would come out in the 1930s, it would have been excellent, but it's just not what the Japanese need at that moment. And I think I've always thought it's interesting that they went down that route, you know. But once again, a lot of it has to do with industrial constraints. The Shikaku would have been the way to go if they could have pulled it off. Yes, I guess they had their winning design. They just couldn't make enough of them. Yeah, exactly. Whereas, you know, we found we found the Essex and we just pumped those out, man. I mean, how many Essex classes did we make during the war? I don't know. I mean, I might be wrong about this, but I think at one point the U.S. had like 80 aircraft carriers or some shit. If I mean, well, I, yeah. That, I mean, I don't know if that includes include, escorts, but I mean, it, it that would have to include escorts. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a crazy number of carriers. That's another one too. I would never do a tier ranking of escorts because, I mean. Or even include them here because the you know the escorts uh, they have a much more limited mission you know defend convoys ferry aircraft support landings you know and what yeah a, there are some escorts that are poorly designed but most of them are kind of within the same range of each other would a uh, sub ranking make sense that could be done I just I'd have to read more about submarines I mean I know the U boats pretty well and some of the American stuff but the British submarine force I know very little about. So I guess that means they probably didn't do that much. Yeah. The Italians, by the way, had a problem with that. They made a lot of different submarine classes, whereas the Germans were like, okay, this Type 7, this Type 7, Type 9, we're sticking with it. You know. The Italians had a lot of submarine classes. You know, and some of them, some of them were pretty good, too. And the, the Italian submarine force had its share of success, um, but they never really found a winning design that they just stuck with. Hmm. So yeah, you got any uh, closing thoughts before we uh, do super chats? No, uh, this is uh, this is interesting. I didn't realize exactly the extent to which the Japanese, even late in the war, were still experimenting like this. But I guess at a certain point, it probably wasn't so much experimenting as well. What can we float? What can we put together and send out? Uh, so I, I feel like they probably could have, in theory, made much, much better carriers in 1944 than this. In theory, yeah. Uh, and, I mean... <coughs> sorry, experimenting with things like, saying like, Tahoe makes perfect sense. You know? Um, you, know to, you know, you want to try it out and see how it works, right? And it, we did the same thing. Uh, the Midway class had an armored flight deck. You know? So we weren't, like, just sticking with just the Essex way. But yeah, some of those Japanese carriers, as you can see, were... To get the Pearl Harbor conversions, which is oh my God, we're at war. We gotta get the we gotta get more carriers, or of course the post Midway emergency conversions, which none of those really worked. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, uh, want to do uh, super chats? Sure. We have two from the last stream. 
I don't know if we got anything from this one. And one here. Oh, we got one here too. Okay. We got one here. We got one on this one too. All right. Yeah, I'll got it. Pull that up real fast. All right, I'll go back to the ones from the first one, and then we'll work our way to the new one. So the first super chat came to us from Michael Delaney for nine ninety nine. Thank you, Michael. He says, "Hey, Thersites, what is the likelihood that you guys will do a pop culture slash prestige TV video with Delano?" I heard you mentioned that in the president's video as well as last week. Seems like a good video. Um, I think there's a pretty good chance. I've talked to Delano about doing something like this at some point. We haven't done it, made any concrete plans. And I don't know exactly his living situation because he just moved to a new area, kind of like what I did. But the difference is that his job situation is a lot more precarious. That being said, it's possible he has a lot of free time. So... We'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk to him and see what he's up to and see if we can set something up. But I think there's a good chance. I think he'd be an entertaining uh, person to bring on. Because if you talk about someone who knows a lot of obscure shit, it's Delano. Nice. Yeah. Um, and when I say obscure, I mean uh, he can tell you about people who were on the indie music scene in 1972. Uh, and then who married a producer for some random B movie and got a writing cool. credit in a show from 1993. I mean, just the most random people you can imagine. And he has an endless arsenal of stories about just the most off the wall people you can imagine. Also, he's what really of... learned about conspiracy theories. Oh, that's nice. What, what type of, um, I mean, what type of stream would you want to do in particular with him that's pop culture related? I don't know, because he could do a lot of different things. He, he also knows a lot about Native American history, which is something we haven't done, um, and something Michael's been wanting to do. So, uh... Oh, that'd be great. That'd yeah, be very good. That could be something we work on. I'm not sure how we'd organize it exactly, but that could be interesting. Um... So yeah, um, also Delano's an expert on postmodernism. He wrote his whole dissertation on whether postmodernism is real or not, I think. So he can do he can do a lot of interesting things we've never done before. So okay. I'll have to think about that, but I think I think that'd be great. Uh, next up we have five dollars from Levant. Thank you, Levant, and he says if you guys had to serve at sea in World War II, would you rather be on an F-tier carrier or an S-tier submarine? How about World War III? <laughs> uh, World War II, I'd choose, I mean, let's look at the F-tier carriers we have in this list. We have the Burn and the Ryuho. Both of them survived the war. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. They Actually, do. You know, Bird was around in the 1960s. So the French were using it as a barrack ship. So, you know, uh, yeah, I think the F-tier carriers, it's to be more roomy and you're less likely to die, oddly enough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a part of me that wants to say, it, you know, the S-tier sub, because I know that especially if you're an American sub, you make a huge impact on the war. But I'm claustrophobic as shit. I don't think I could make it on a, a World War II sub. I'm maybe right, that takes care of that. Yeah, maybe a modern one, if I'm taking, like, Dramamine or whatever the fuck you take for claustrophobia. I don't even know. Um, I'd have to be on some medicine, though. I, I don't think I could do it just uh, by grid alone. Uh, so, in World War Three, though, I think I'd take my chances on the submarine. Just because I have a feeling that if we got in a major war right now, carrier losses would be pretty bad. Yeah, right now I do submarine as well for World War Three. Yeah. Um, so next up we have Zach Gilliam for twenty bucks. Thank you, Zach. And he says, "My life is carrier fire." LOL. I got some more books of interest. Hope all is going well for both their sites and Sean Check. Well, thank you, Zach, and uh, I'll uh, hit you up about the books when I get a chance. On Discord. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it, buddy. Oh, uh, Thoughtful Pug says there is another image of the Unryu, but when it's sinking. Yeah. And then there's the one where the Unryu is sinking. You get the uh, stern 
pointing out. That was take photos taken by USS Redfish. Oh, somebody said uh, Michael Delaney. 105 total carriers, 64 were escorts, but still, I mean that's 40 fleet carriers. 41 fleet carriers. I mean that's that's a lot. That's a lot of airplanes. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Oh, we got another super chat here. We did from Athelwolf, which I believe is a name taken straight out of Anglo-Saxon England. Uh, he gave us five dollars. Thank you, Ethel Wolf, and he says thanks for the great stuff. Do you guys like Drakenfell's channel? Uh, like you guys, it just blows my mind how knowledgeable some people can be. Well, I know you're a big fan of Drakenfell, and I think you've been on this channel before, haven't you? Yeah, I did two videos on uh, river operations in the Civil War, uh, and we, me and him, did some, talked a bit um, before and after that about some other things. Uh, yeah, I love his channel. It's great stuff. Uh, it might be the best all-around history channel on YouTube. Oh, sorry, Thersites. <laughs> well, I don't do the... Uh, not a, not as big in the naval stuff. but uh, yeah, From what, it, what it, I've it seen of his material, business. yeah, it's really good. Uh, yeah, no, he does, he does some great stuff there. Uh, I also find he's overall pretty, pretty fair about things. Yeah. Um, not too too many axes to grind. I mean, everybody's got their share of them, you know. And he can be pretty dry, funny about that. Like when he talks about Beatty at Jutland, you know, you can tell he doesn't like Beatty. Uh, but you no, know, no, he's a great channel. Always recommend it. Um, yeah, excellent stuff. Uh, if I if I ever get back on his channel to do another thing, it'd probably be for Port Hudson, since that's Port Hudson or the fall of New Orleans. You know, get into the details of how that went down during the Civil War. You know. Um, yeah so what are you thinking about doing uh, next week a uh, good question I don't know um, I guess one thing I could do is try to hit up Delano to see what he's up to these days uh, otherwise okay. I don't know um, hmm I wish I wish that we knew more about ship designs in antiquity, because I know that there were adjustments that were made to even the triremes. So I know in the late Peloponnesian War they are designed a little bit sleeker, or maybe sturdier than the earlier designs. Yeah. But I don't know the exact specifications, and of course there aren't like uh, class names or anything like that that you can access, and there aren't schematics or whatever. So it's yeah. uh, it'd be impossible to do something like we did here tonight. Uh, but yeah, it's really too bad we don't know more about ancient naval warfare because that is pretty interesting you know what I feel like we really don't know anything about me, know much about or at least I don't medieval naval warfare Um, pretty similar to ancient naval warfare actually except probably a I little bit so. less skilled although actually I to thought be, so yeah the norm for, for no, the norm for uh, pre gunpowder naval warfare is boarding action. Hmm, that makes sense. Yeah, the the big exception is that the Athenians were skilled enough to shear off oars and disable ships, and then capture them by towing them. Yeah. Are you talking about being unfairly skilled? Naval battle in the... <laughs> yeah. I, there was apparently a very important naval battle in the Hundred Years' War that people don't talk about as much, but I think Henry V won it, or one of his people did, you know? But I just don't hear... That's the thing about ancient naval warfare is I do hear about decisive naval battles, right? I don't really hear about that many in the Middle Ages. I'm not saying they didn't happen, just it seems like nobody ever talks about them if they did. Yeah, um... I mean, I guess by the time you get to Lepanto, that's basically early modern. I mean, it's 1571. Yeah. That's a decisive naval battle, but yeah, for the most part, you're right. There aren't that many large-scale naval battles, um, although there are lots of small-scale ones, especially against the Vikings. Uh, yeah. But to be fair, there also aren't a yeah. ton of ancient naval battles either. I mean, we have a few that are really well-known, like Actium, but uh, usually fleet actions were not that common, and partly it's because, if you think about it, Detecting an an enemy fleet is way harder than it seems in the ancient world. Oh, Actually, yeah. your chance of running a blockade is pretty good, even if the other the enemy's expecting you and running patrols. 
okay. Yeah, that's uh, a lot more dicey later on, right? Yeah, I mean, once you get uh, uh, right, cool, different technologies in place, then yeah, it becomes much more dicey. But that's part of why Antony's fleet was able to shoot over to Greece, even though Bibulus was patrolling and looking for him. Okay. If he had gotten caught, yeah, he'd have been well, in trouble. Uh, yeah. Right, we got another one well, from... Sir, uh, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to... Uh, I, I wish I... I wish I hadn't been as hot today. I felt a little bit off today, you know, and I'm definitely going to turn in early because I've got a tour tomorrow morning. So I have two tours, and it looks like tomorrow's another scorcher. Okay. You know? Yeah, sorry about the heat. Uh, we Did we get one last super chat just now from uh, Oscar Palacios, though? Oh, we did? Yeah, it won't take too long to answer. Fine, what we got, man? He gave us five bucks. Thank you, Oscar. And he says, can you do best Roman generals like Sertorius, Lucullus, and Agrippa? My favorite is Aurelian, but the best is Scipio. Caesar always ran out of food. <laughs> he did. <laughs> yeah, no, Caesar, Caesar was surprisingly not that good at logistics. Of all, of all the great generals, he is probably the worst at logistics. I'm thinking about who else would be pretty bad. I, I mean, the Germans were never that great at it, especially in World War II. You know, although I'm yeah. also I'm not necessarily saying like one of them is like Caesar level. No, I don't think any right? of them were. I mean, that's no disrespect, but I don't think any of them were on Caesar's level. Yeah. Yeah, no, Caesar's one that, yeah, Caesar's definitely, like, that's his weakness. Of, well, there's a few, but that's a big one. <laughs> yeah, he, he relies uh, on luck, so, but it always kind of worked out somehow. So if you don't do pop culture thing next week, what are you thinking? Um, well, we could do that, or we could always do the Sega Genesis thing we talked about. Yeah, I'm down for uh, Sega Genesis. What's the parameters for that one? Um, like, uh, we'd be tier ranking, like... Yeah, tier ranking like, about what? 100 games. Like, uh, 100? Holy shit. I mean, well, you gotta remember, I know Genesis pretty games. damn well. I mean, I know I know yeah, Genesis like, the way I... that... Uh, what's it? Lance knows uh, NES. Still, it'd be, that's like... God, that, that's true. We take, like six hours no it wouldn't i mean a lot of those i don't have that much to say about it's just like yes yeah, a beat em up pretty good or pretty dog shit okay i'm just, i think it would take a while man <laughs> but yeah you know um yeah if you doesn't want to do that one I'm, I'm down for sega all right you know the burping dinosaur from jurassic park sega oh yeah <laughs> That's in the uh, Jurassic Park uh, Sega game. That's that's a good one. I like that game. It's like a survival horror side scroller. That's good. Don't see too much of. Uh, somebody says they want to do a super chat and they're just putting in their information. So I think we just wait uh, wait on that one then. You know. All right. Well, Jaden Creaser, uh, you do what you got to do, yeah. buddy. Yeah, yeah. We'll uh, we'll uh, we'll hang around a bit longer. Um, I'm just um, I just wish I was more hundred percent right now. Yeah, I'm flagging too because I didn't sleep too well last night. I had to take a nap this afternoon, which is very rare for me. Uh, I, I do that yesterday. I had to take a nap because um, Saturday night was like one of those like long nights that just went on and on forever. Good night, yeah. but still, you know. Uh, and so I was working on the Shiloh stuff, and I could just feel myself dying. I'm like, oh god, I'm just losing it, man. <laughs> uh. You know, so and just uh, hoping that the uh, tours tomorrow are going to be good. You know, hope we get some decent numbers. Um, but yeah, you know. Oh yeah, what about um? Oh, what about oh yeah? Since uh, since I got you here, what what did you make of the uh, the 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 Trump raid? Um, it. I'm just glad to see that there is some accountability for a rich person who has power. Um, I never thought I'd live to see the day when something like that happened. So, yeah, that, that's my main yeah, takeaway. Yeah, but no, 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 no. The thing about that though is he pissed off other rich people. That's true. You know, like, like I used to say about Bernie Madoff. I'm like the reason you're about, the reason Bernie Madoff got in trouble is he ripped off rich people. <laughs> well, there's a lot to that, yeah. But I mean, uh, still, at least it hopefully 
impresses upon people the necessity and the doability of holding rich people to account. Yeah. Well, there's also uh, Samuel Israel III. He was another hedge fund guy who got in trouble around the same time. He's from New Orleans. I go to his home in the... Uh, well, not his home. He, he was a teenager when he lived in this home in the Garden District, so I talk about him there sometimes. Um, yeah, he's another... He's a, he's a guy. He... Um, God, God, I'm trying to remember. Like, he, he had a book written about him, and... I remember when he's up for parole. I think 2027. Hmm. Yeah, he says 20 years in prison. <laughs> That's what do insane. You do? I mean, he defrauded people. Oh, you know, well, good. Fuck him. But you're like, oh yeah, no, no. But the thing is, what I'm trying to say is, like, a guy like him. I'm like, I think part of the reason he got in as much trouble as he is, he, he defrauded rich people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, uh, it, I mean, yeah. the similar penalties should apply to people who screw over poor people, obviously. Um, and even though it's insufficient in of itself still is a step in the right direction and with Trump what really surprises well it doesn't surprise me what kind of horrifies me is apparently for some reason he was keeping nuclear codes in his personal records I mean what the fuck why would anybody uh, let him leave the White House with that why wouldn't the yeah, Secret Service have details. taken that don't know. I'd have to look more into that one. I mean, that, that to me I seems a little off. People, well, I mean, so I mean, you know, like like uh, there was some like apparently there was some off stuff with Obama too. I, mean, I don't think it was nuclear codes, but like I said, I don't really know a lot about that angle of it. I just feel like it's just very uh, very political because he's finally giving that giving the sign of I'm going to run again. But also, a lot of people he's endorsed have won their primaries lately. You know and. I also honestly think this may not have happened if Biden was looking good, but he's not. You know, so the the the, the idea that that Trump would run in 2024 and beat Biden is a very real possibility, and I think they're trying to stop it now. That's what I think. That's that's what I personally think is going on here. It could be. You know, um, although I guess to be fair, if you think about it, like what Biden needs to shore himself up. I mean, something like this is red meat for the base. I guess red meat for both bases, right? Yeah, it is, because for the the Trump people, it fuels the narrative that Trump's an outsider, that he's persecuted, that yeah. he's one of us. He, you know, he can be... He, the government's against him. Uh, and it also strengthens the hands of his loyalists against DeSantis. Because this makes Trump more exciting yeah, and interesting. He's now pulling, I mean, he's been pulling ahead of him for a bit. Yeah, apparently right now uh, the distance between uh, Trump and DeSantis has expanded in the last few months, but especially in the last week. Um, so you have a number of people who think that this was also... Yeah. Okay, here it is. All right. So the super chat from Jaden reads, um, I save all of the ISIS media... Whoa. I save all of the ISIS media I can possibly find because I feel like people are trying to wipe it off the internet. As someone who is a historian, am I doing the right thing? Uh, I would say so. I mean, you're preserved for historical record. Yeah, I'm inclined to right? agree. That's what it sounds like to me. Because otherwise it might get classified, and then people have to wait 30 years to read old internet posts. So keeping it available, I think, is a valuable service. I'm all about archiving things and preserving things, especially having multiple places where things are saved. So if people yeah, save some stuff on their hard drives as well, that is very useful. And Oscar Palacios has another one for he us. Does. So he asks for five dollars. Thank you, Oscar. What's uh, your opinion on the Pelosi visit to Taiwan? I presume and the current build of the CCP naval buildup. Uh, most importantly, their carrier design and doctrine. Um, Nothing I, mean, I, I can say about the carry design. And I can't really talk about the carry designer doctrine myself. I haven't really looked into it in particular. Uh, which you, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was going to say, I think a lot of the Pelosi visit is the Biden administration and the Democrats 
more generally because they didn't get involved in Ukraine and got out of Afghanistan doing some saber rattling and showing that they still have it because again you know they get a lot of their money from uh, the in defense industry so they have to show that they're willing to fight someone and because a war with China most likely won't happen within the next say five years this is a I guess quote unquote safe saber rattle for them to do and it also hopefully secure some defense contracts for their buddies. I mean, that's my take on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, I, I'd agree with that. I also, um, I don't think that this is like some decisive moment, you know, um, but I think it's just a sign of the, you know, the deterioration of relations, which, you know, started honestly started under Obama, but it was a little more muted, and you know, it's really been ratcheted up in the last year. And a lot of that has to do with Ukraine, right? You know, and um, um, and some of that's also just this will also has to be diplomatic frustration too. I mean, the rest, the most of the rest of the world didn't join in on the uh, let's boycott Russia movement, you know. So, and <clears throat> uh, anyway, you were saying, yeah, I think too. Uh, even though Obama and others have tried to keep it on the DL, I think in reality America's relations with China have been declining for a bit, and this is just being made explicit now. Uh, but in reality, I think the U.S. has always planned to defend Taiwan in the event of an invasion. I just think before it was, they politely said they weren't going to do that, or at least said we don't know what we'll do. And I think what all Biden did is take something that was already the case and make it explicit. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I I wonder if we would have defended Taiwan at a different time, but also the idea of Taiwan being attacked really hasn't become a serious possibility until 2020. I mean, that was the first time the Jap the Chinese military let the apparently let the powers to be say like, "Okay, if you want to do it, it can be done." Right. You know, before that, they were never they they weren't able to do it, and that doesn't mean that they would succeed. Just that by their own assessment, they believe that now they actually can, which was not the case before. Yeah, so the U.S. is stepping up its support partly just because the threat is more real, and also Biden needs to look yeah. tough. So, yeah, <clears throat> between those things, that's oh, we've got, we got another super chat. We do from Oli Frederick. Uh, name with an insufficient number of vowels, uh, Skjedstag. Uh, I, I definitely butchered that. But he says, uh, great stuff, guys. <laughs> Have you considered doing presidential deep dives for earlier presidents? Uh, as a matter of fact, yes. We have considered that, for sure. Yeah, um, most certainly. I mean, we kind of, I guess we already kind of did one with um, uh, Franklin Pierce, essentially, by also talking about him in relation to Biden, naturally. Um, what are you, uh, who would you want to do for an earlier president? Well, I think LBJ is a must do. Um, so LBJ, okay. Woodrow Wilson, uh, FDR Truman. Um, definitely FDR. Yeah. And I'm trying to think who else would be really interesting to go through. Uh, maybe... Hmm. I'm trying to think of a really interesting 19th century president. I mean, maybe also someone like Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, he's a little later. Uh, I feel like mo more of the modern presidents yeah. are a little more interesting, but uh, there there are some One of the, of the ones 19th I think century I'd like guys to who are interesting. You go ahead. Uh, I would. I'd, one I'd really want to do is Grover Cleveland, because I. Um, I think there's also kind of a Grover Cleveland moment going on right now. <laughs> and, I mean, Grover Cleveland's really incompetent. I mean, he's really bad. You know, uh, it's a groaner, man. Um, you know, could do Benjamin Harrison. He, he got a lot done, as I said. Like, he's he's kind of underrated in his capacity to get things done, but he's just so boring, personally. Um, <clears throat> Pre-Civil War, uh, Andrew Jackson. Oh, I, yeah, that's a big one. 
that's I mean that's that's where a lot of the action's at, huh? But also, I'd, I'd love to do James Buchanan. Yes. And Tyler. Uh, I mean, honestly, probably if this keeps going on for as long as it does, we'll get to all the presidents. <laughs> yeah, I guess Washington and Lincoln so, yeah. are also options just because of their prominence and importance. Yeah, for Lincoln, what I'd want to read is there's apparently a four-volume book by William Marvel on, on Lincoln's administration that I'd like to read. And he's very, he takes a much more negative opinion of Lincoln. Uh and yeah, I mean, I've read about a lot of other Lincoln stuff, so I've I've heard I've heard the positive takes my whole life. So I'd like to re if I'm going to do Lincoln, that's what I would do. I'd read that one to get myself ready, so you can have like a different point of view. Also, Marvel's an excellent historian. Um, he's one, he's easily one of the ten, ten or twenty best Civil War historians I know of. So, um, if he's going to knock Lincoln around, he'll have some evidence to back himself, back it up, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, and we got another one now from Ed yeah. Gee for five dollars. Thank yeah. you, Ed. He says, "Hello, fellas. Was Albert Thanks. Sidney Johnson really the best general for the Confederacy?" Well, uh, Albert Sidney Johnston, going into the war, is one of the one of the most respected officers in the U.S. Army. Uh, he apparently was going to be offered command of the main field army, so the Robert E. Lee turned it down. Apparently, Albert Sidney Johnston was supposed to be the next one up. Uh, and, I mean, he's Jefferson Davis's role model. There's no doubt that when he, whoever's, whichever side he would have joined was going to give him a high rank, no matter what. Being Davis's friend means that Johnson is the highest ranking field officer of the Confederacy. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell. Johnston did not do the best, didn't have the best staff. The staff work was pretty shoddy. But then again, so was everybody in 1861 to 62. I don't know of a single general in either army who had an excellent staff in the first year or two of the war. Definitely the first year, all right? Um, you know, uh, so he, um, he, he, didn't, he didn't have a bad strategic mind, uh, but sometimes he wasn't particularly decisive. On the actual battlefield, he's being shot at. He's amazing. So, I mean, best. I mean, I don't know. He, did, he died too. He died too soon to have a firm opinion on him. He definitely showed some talents for sure, though. One talent he particularly had, though, is that of uh, he was one of the few Confederate generals who seems to have gotten along with most of his subordinates, which is no minor achievement in the Confederacy. <laughs> you know. Yeah, as we've seen. <laughs> On many yeah. occasions, no minor achievement. I'm not. I am not going to dismiss that. That is a, that is a skill. All right, and the, you could make a case that, of course, Johnston dying. I mean, it doesn't decide to deprive the Confederacy of like a great general, but you know, a lot of this uh, Confederate veteran stuff I've been reading, like especially the magazine Confederate Veteran. There's this vibe where the men think that, you know, whatever your opinion of Bragg, Joe Johnston, or Hood is, none of them were as good as Albert Sidney Johnston. So a lot of those guys, especially the Shiloh veterans, felt that their the Western Lee might have been taken too early. Certainly, Jefferson Davis felt that way. He thought the death of Albert Sidney Johnston was one of the decisive moments of the Civil War. But of course he'd feel that way. Did the veterans ever it? wonder about Beauregard? Say if Beauregard had been given a little more leniency? Uh, yes, yeah, some did. Uh James Longstreet had a good opinion of Beauregard and actually wrote that, you know, if Beauregard had been, Beauregard had great military talents that weren't properly cultivated. Um, that said, Confederate Veteran magazine was pretty negative about Beauregard because they blamed him for Shiloh. You know. Uh, but no, he had a number of people who thought that he should have been given more responsibility. More commands, you know. So... All right, guys. I'm gonna have to call it quits on my end. I gotta. I'm tired, man. I gotta go. To, I'm gonna go to sleep. Yeah, same here. I got a long day tomorrow. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm teaching effectively from twelve thirty to six o'clock. So, pretty long day. That's a long haul of teaching. How many classes are you do in total? Three. Oh, uh, well, three on in that stretch, and then two on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay. So five total. All right. How many were you teaching in Ohio? Um, usually, when I was still a grad student, I was only teaching one. Once I started lecturing, 
I taught four and then three. Uh, both of those are full-time loads. And this is almost gotcha. a double full-time load. All right, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and bow out. Thank you all, everyone. It's been a nice, fun night talking about flat tops. Yep. <laughs> Blow them up. <laughs> bang, bang. Bye. Bye. All right. Let's close this down.